Let's pray. Father, your kindness is seen in many ways towards us. But Lord, we know that the fact that you have spoken and that you have preserved your spoken word for us, for our good, for our instruction. Father, it is a kind gift that you have given us. Father, we are thankful that you have not left us without your guidance. And Father, we pray this morning that you, by your Spirit, would use these words that have just been read. That Lord, as we think upon them and reflect upon them, Father, as we see the the encouragement that comes from it, the, the implications that we have for our own lives found here in this passage, Father, we ask your Spirit to work through your Word to do much good for us, your people. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. When we talked last week about drawing near to God, part of the question then becomes more, how do we do that? And the Psalms provide for us both prompts and patterns for how to draw near to God. And as we think about that further theme of drawing near to God, it's helpful for us to think sort of building on last week, why should we do that? Or what are some obstacles that could come and prevent us from drawing near to God? And that sort of leads us to begin with a very important question this morning. How do you see God? Now, I'm not talking about physical sight here this morning, but how do you view God? When, the, when you hear the term God, what comes to your mind when you think about Him? And how do you feel about the thoughts that come into your mind when you think about God? What is it that has shaped your view, that view of God, even now in your mind that you have, what has shaped it? What people, what experiences, what teachings have influenced the way that you think and feel about God? You say, Seth, well, why does this matter? Well, because if you don't have a right view of God, then why would you draw near to Him, right? If you don't think God is good, why would you draw near to a God who isn't good? If you don't think God has any good for you, why waste your time with Him, right? So it's important for us to get a right view of God so that we would have the right motivation of desiring to draw near to Him. But if you saw God as distant or somehow disapproving or harsh or uncaring or sort of an absent tea father, then there's no need to draw near to Him. And then sort of on our sermon title this morning, there is really no good with God. And so we need a biblical view of God. In addition to that, it has always sort of been popular for people to think it their right to think of God on their own terms. right? And you really can't devise a more silly idea to think that we can determine who God is sort of based on our own imagination. God is, He exists, And he has an exact definition to who he is. He is the way he is. And what we think about him doesn't change that. Right? God is not, as some would argue, some projection of our own thoughts upon him. And the way that we get to know this God, the way he truly is, and avoid sort of believing in a false God, is that God has made himself known to us. He has spoken. He is there and He is not silent. And three specific ways that He has spoken. He has spoken through us through creation. He has revealed His power through creation. Psalm 19 tells us this, that the heavens declare the glory of God. He has revealed Himself through His Son, Jesus. In the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and exact imprint of His nature. So you want to know God's nature? We see that in His Son, Jesus Christ. And then, of course, in the Bible itself, in special revelation, that God, in great detail, lays out His nature, 
and the purposes that He has revealed to us about His dealings with His people that He has created. So we have to make sure that our view and knowledge of God is based on what God has revealed of Himself. If we want that to grow sort of increasingly more and more accurate as we understand the Scripture. So then, with that right view of God, we will have an impulse, a desire to draw near to Him because we are thinking rightly about Him. But the second thing that we have to have a right view of is a view of ourselves. So we've asked, how do you view God? But, and we want to have a right view of God, but we also have to have a right view of ourselves. And so how, this morning, do you see you? Right? Because if you see yourself as just fine, thank you, if you see yourself as independent and self-sufficient, then you have no need to draw near to God. That's why it's important for us, if our view of God is off, we wouldn't view, draw near to God. And if our view of ourselves is off, then we would not need to draw near to God. So both of those have to be right. And here, this is where particularly the Psalms, but in particularly David, who wrote many of the Psalms, is so helpful for us in thinking about how we view ourselves in particular. Because if you read the Psalms, particularly the ones that David has written, you sort of get this vision and image of David as a needy person. Right? In one sense, you, you can almost read this sometimes and feel like, I don't know if I really want to be around this guy because he's always talking about the problems that he has, and he seems to be a man that problems followed around everywhere that he went. There's always some issue that he's facing, and he's coming to God in distress and darkness and despair, sort of in barrenness, and he's crying out to the God, always something. But as you read more and more of David, you can find yourselves hopefully identifying with Him. Sort of finding you able to map your own life upon David's life. And what he says can resonate with our own experience. And it's not just some woe is me type of attitude. That's really not what David was doing. There's, there's something else that's going on. And even though our situations are different, right? I don't think anyone in this room, I know I haven't, been chased out into the wilderness and had to hide in a cave because there was a band of people trying to kill me, right? That's what David would find himself into, and that led to writing many of these songs. So even though our situations are different, there is still something in these psalms, an expression of the heart that we can relate to as fellow human beings. It's like that this Word is living and active. It's like that it has the ability to speak to something that is common to all humans. And so God gave these songs to help us, to help us in our lives to draw near to Him by giving us promptings from them, but also giving us a pattern of how we can do so. So we, like David, need to be near God in all of life's circumstances. In our fears, in our tragedies, in our doubts, we need to be near to God. But also in our moments of joy, in our moments of triumphs, in our moments of great hope, we need to draw near to God. And when we see God rightly, and when we view ourselves rightly, then we will possess a huge impulse to draw near to God. And so this morning, I want us to look and examine here in Psalm 16 and hopefully see from David his own personal living encounter with God and that we can learn from this. Notice in verse 1, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. So here is David. And he is actually turning to God for refuge, for safety, for protection. And he's not just saying this, he's actually doing it. He is looking to God as a refuge. And we imagine, we sort of, if you're like me, your imagination starts to run and say, well, why is he doing that? Why does he have this need for refuge? What's his situation? Is he in trouble? 
Is there some type of emotional distress that he's facing? Well, we don't fully know the answer to that. But in verse 2, we get a little bit of a hint that he's coming to God not because of something bad in his life, right? That's what we typically do when something bad's happening. We use that as an as a impulse to draw near to God. We need help. And that's good and right. We see examples of that in the Scripture. But here, it's not as though something bad has happened to his life but rather because there is something good in God. So he's drawing near to God, not because something bad has happened. He does that in other Psalms. But now that which is pushing him to draw near to God is because there is something good in the Lord. Notice what he says in verse 2. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. The good that exists in David's life, he says, is in God. And so therefore, I will call him my Lord. I will look to draw near to him as my refuge. David is saying, God, you are my highest treasure. Nothing can be as valuable to me as you. Nothing that I have can be offered to match your value. And maybe in his situation, there is a a keen awareness that there are other things in his life that are making claims of being his ultimate good. Right? You think of of the many things that David himself accomplished in his life. You can think the position of influence that he had, his reputation, right? Sort of whispering in his ears saying, David, people look to you. They look to you for leadership. They look to you as 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 a hero, as a deliverer of God's people. So find your good in this reputation you have, his accomplishments, things in his life saying, here is what's good for you, David. Find your joy, find your satisfaction in these things. And sort of like David, David knows better. He has lived and experienced close fellowship to God. And yet every one of us, like David, face these types of temptations on a daily basis, to think that our good, greatest good, lies apart from God. That we can find good, joy, happiness, apart from drawing near to God, who, like David tells us, is our only source of good. Like David, we should say, I have no good apart from God. And so we are tempted to find our good, our joy in our accomplishments, in our positions, in power that we can accumulate for ourselves or in our influence over other people. David felt these tugs as we do. And it is into this situation that David cries out, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, You are my God. I have no good apart from you. And as we continue to read this, as we see that our safety and our well-being and our joy and our good is not going to be found anywhere else apart from God. And as we continue to read this psalm, I want you to see that David knows that it is good for him to be with God. That's where his good is, and that's why he wants to draw near to him. And I want to show you this by pointing and drawing your attention to four dimensions of our lives that prove God's goodness. If you're here this morning, you're tempted to think or to doubt God is good. I want to remind you, refresh your mind with these dimensions of our lives that prove God's goodness as sort of a hope that it will stir within you to not shrink back from the Lord, but to draw near to Him. The first dimension here is our present spiritual possession. Our present spiritual possession. We see that there in verses 5 and 6. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. So here, David, in verses 5 and 6, talks about what he has in God. 
And in God, He has a chosen portion. The Lord is my chosen portion. In the Hebrew, it really says it this way, the Lord is the portion of my portion. Of all that I have, He is it. He's the top thing. Nothing greater than that. And of all the stuff that I possess, David says, God is my best. He is my portion. I have Him. He belongs to me and I belong to Him. And so David is saying to God, I have no treasure. I have nothing that I value more highly than you, and you have given yourself to me. You are my chosen portion. You are my Lord. Verse 1 and 2. So David makes that clear. And then he switches images and speaks of the Lord not as just something that he possesses as his chosen portion, but he speaks of him as his cup, right? That's an odd thing to think of God. Well, God is my cup. Right? I don't think we'd ever say that, even no matter how much you love Tupperware, right? You never get to that point. But there's something deeper behind this image, right? The, David isn't just using cup there. He's using it as a metaphor. And he's using the idea of a cup as something that has a constant supply, a, a satisfying drink which refreshes and restores David. Uh, Jesus sort of picks up on this image in the Gospel of John chapter 4. He, he meets this woman as he's waiting meets this woman at a well, and, and notice the, 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 the imagery that, that Jesus uses when he picks up on this idea of a, a satisfying drink. There in John chapter 4, verse 7, hear this story. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me drink. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, have you, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. He who drinks of what I give, of me, Jesus says, will never be thirsty again because a well basically will be created within him that will be constantly supplying and satisfying his soul. David is speaking of that same thing here when he speaks of the Lord, not only of his chosen portion, but also as his cup, an, a source of everlasting goodness in his life. Then he switches images again there in verse 6. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. And by lines there, he means measuring lines. This is how in David's day, people would plot out their property. They would lay these lines, and David is saying, these lines have been given to me, and they mark out a pleasant place. The inheritance I have received from the Lord is a beautiful inheritance. And David cannot believe how pleasant the place that has been entrusted to him to dwell so in verses 5 and 6 here, David is speaking about what he has received from God, that God is his chosen portion. He is his cup, his everlasting supply of, of happiness and of joy, his source of all life, and that God has entrusted to him a, a beautiful place, a, a great and blessed inheritance. What he has in the present is a spiritual possession. And like David... If we have our faith in God, and as Christians, if our faith is in Christ, we think of the many present spiritual possessions that have been trusted to us because the Lord is our chosen portion. That we have a new status, that we are no longer aliens to God, but we are His beloved children. And if His children, then we are heirs to an inheritance that is laid up for us in heaven that we have a new companion, that Jesus is our Savior, our brother, and that He is with us at all times, never departing from us, never forsaking us. We have a new helper in the Spirit who is a comforter, a guide to us, one who is the source of our new life. 
We have a new hope. We have all these things, and there are, there are more and blessing upon blessings that, it, that are ours because God is our chosen portion. No good thing does He withhold from His children. We have this present spiritual possession, and it is a proof that God is good. And as a reason, and as such, as a reason of that, we should incline us to draw near to Him, to the One who has given us all these things. The second dimension here of our lives that prove God's goodness is our ongoing spiritual provision from the Lord. In verses 7 and 8 here, David sees what he has in God in terms of his daily spiritual provision. Provision, Not just the spiritual position, possession he already possesses, but now this daily spiritual provision that is always being made known to him. Notice here in verses 7 and 8. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. David's saying, I have this daily provision from God. I have His counsel. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. So like David, are you conscious of God giving you counsel, guiding you, directing your steps? The Scripture constantly promises this. And David is aware that this is how the Lord blesses him. This is a form of spiritual provision. Now, this sort of builds on the theme that we talked about last night, or excuse me, not last night, last Sunday, that when we draw near to God, that's how we fellowship with Him. And we can't expect, right, to hear from God if we don't spend time with Him. How are we going to hear His counsel and His guidance if we do not draw near? But indeed, this is one form of his ongoing spiritual provision that God gives us guidance. He gives us counsel. And David says that helps so much, right? As I lay down at bed at night and my heart and my thoughts are swarming everywhere, God in his counsel, in his guidance, instructs my heart, gives me direction. And then in verse 8, he goes on to say, I've set the Lord before I have set the Lord always before me. There's an intentionality there, right? It's not sort of, sort of willy-nilly or, well, if it happens, it happens with dealing with the Lord. He's intentional to set and to think about the Lord and to think about His ways and to think about His promises that He had made to David. He's saying, I set the Lord before me in that way. And as a result, he says, because He is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. As he's sitting there at night thinking on his bed, he sets the Lord before him. These are the, his character. This is God's promises to me. As I set the Lord before me, I'm reminded he is always at my right hand. And the result is he is not shaken. God's guidance, his instruction, his closeness in the midst of David's life gives him assurance that God's guidance brings him stability. He's not tossed to and fro. He's not shaken. He's not worried. He, he brings, finds faith and trust in the fact that God has instructed his heart. And God's instruction proves his closeness. And his closeness means he is confident he will not be shaken. David takes a conscious effort to set the Lord before him, his promises, his character. And as a result, he is reminded through this counsel that he has a massive, unassailable Stability. He will not be shaken. Even if he feels like it, even if we feel like it, as we set the Lord before us, we will receive his counsel, and with that counsel, we will find a stability in our lives. It's the old spiritual song says, Glory, hallelujah, I shall not be moved. Anchored in Jehovah, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water, I shall not be moved. In His love abiding, I shall not be moved. And in Him confiding, I shall not be moved. Just like the tree that's planted by the water, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Though all hell assail me, 
I shall not be moved. Jesus will not fail me. I shall not be moved. Though the tempest rages, I shall not be moved. On the rock of ages, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water, I shall not be moved. As David says, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. That is an absolute stability that is promised to us, provision on a daily basis from the the Lord our God, which proves His goodness to us. And with that goodness, another reason why our hearts should be inclined to draw near to this God, apart from whom we have no good. We've seen our present spiritual possession, our ongoing spiritual provision. I want you to draw your attention now to verses 9 and 10 to our final spiritual safety. Our final spiritual safety. In verses 9 and 10, David says what he has in God's in sort of terms of his safety. The safety of his very existence relies upon the Lord. And he knows that he can feel times of despair. He can feel times of fear. He's experienced it on many occasions, even recorded in the Psalms, and you can go and look at his life as it's recorded in the historical books of the Old Testament that show those accounts that he faced where he must have had great fear, overwhelmed by fear. And we, like David, can experience these times of despair, of, of being overwhelmed by the circumstances that surround us and overwhelmed by the turmoil that we feel in our own souls. Right? Not talking about just this overwhelmed by our schedules, but something deeper than that. And when we get in those moments, we can be frightened. We can be scared. Will we make it? And some of you know this experience very well. It's part of the frailty that we experience as human beings touched and cursed by sin. And you need to know that this verse is in your Bible. You have these feelings of despair, of your fragile nature, and you can wonder what is going to become of you. How are you going to make it and survive wondering these things? We feel this way. And sometimes those who are on the outside of our lives looking in can see our reaction and they can sort of say, you know, sure, what you're facing is bad, but really? This is the depth of your reaction? It's a bit overkill, isn't it? Maybe you've been there. But the reality is we can still react that way. Though logically it's not makes sense to have this level of despair, that is what we feel. Dark, hopeless. And sometimes in the midst of that, a spiritual frantic can take over in our lives. To some extent, there is a susceptibility of this in each and every one of us. And through sin, death has been given a foothold in our lives here on this earth. And so there is a fear that can be associated with that. David says there in verse 9, Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices, my flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. The Old Testament uses the word Sheol there in verse 10 and in other places to speak about the grave, about death. And Sheol is commonly pictured as this huge, relentless monster who's standing there with its mouth wide open for all of human life to swallow it up, to bring destruction. Sort of communicating that the the end of the children of men is inevitable. Death. The corruption and the rotting of the body. That's what David means there in verse 10. But there is something stronger than Sheol. There is a promise that has been made by God to His people. And there is a power to accomplish that promise that has been entrusted to God's own Son. But David feels this security, and as a result, he says, Therefore my heart is glad. 
If anyone, Jesus said, is abiding in me, he will not even see death. In John 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus said. And David would echo a hearty amen. Yes, therefore my heart is glad. And my whole being rejoices for my flesh also dwells secure. Because he knows his God will not abandon him to Sheol. His Holy One will not see corruption. And the reason that that is possible is the New Testament picks up on in the book of Acts, the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul in Acts 13 quotes this very psalm in preaching and making sense of the death and resurrection of Jesus. I'm just going to read one section here in Acts chapter 2, verses 25. If you want to follow along, if not, you can just listen. For David says concerning him, That is, in verse 24, God raised him up, Jesus, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life and you will make me full of gladness with your presence. And and Peter says, commenting on that, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his, his descendants on his throne, David foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are his witnesses. You could go on later and read in Acts chapter 13, verses 28 and following, Peter, Paul's use of this same psalm to, to convince people of the resurrection of Christ. And so the reason David could have hope in an ultimate deliverance from Sheol, from the grave, from death, is because Jesus himself would come and that he would be abandoned and separated on the cross from his father, but ultimately would not be abandoned in the grave that his father would reward his suffering on the cross by raising him from the dead. You say, Seth, why does that matter? Because with the raising of Jesus, the father entrusted Jesus with the authority and power to give life to whomever he wills. And Jesus has said, everyone who believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. Those who trust in Christ, that his death on the cross is the only way for our sin against God to be removed... Those Jesus gives life to and those alone. And as a result of that promise, if you're trusting in that, you have a proof of God's goodness to you in a final safety of your soul. Promised that God will not abandon you in the grave. You will triumph over death just as your Savior did. A triumphant resurrection. And this truth that our final spiritual safety is secure is another proof of God's goodness and should incline us to draw near to God. The last dimension of our lives that proves God's goodness there is our complete spiritual wholeness seen in verse 11 of Psalm 16. You see here, David sees what he has in God in terms of his total well-being, both now in the present and forever. Notice what he says there in verse 11. You make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The path of life here is called that not just because where it leads to life, that is true, but because to walk out the path God has given is life. It's how he's designed it to be. And God is the one who shows us this path. We saw it earlier with the counsel and guidance. He shows us the path He wants us to take because there is care and there is concern in this God for His people. He wants us to draw near to Him. 
And in His presence, David says, there isn't just a little joy. There is the fullness of joy. And that ought to make us want to be near Him. In His right hand, there are pleasures. There is happiness, not just now, but forevermore, David says. And that makes us want to draw near to Him. God has good for us. As a matter of fact, there is no good for God's people apart from God. And therefore, if we want good, if we want joy, if we want life, if we want happiness, it is found in closeness to God. And that's why David says in verses 1 and 2, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge in my source of good. That's where I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, and I have no good apart from you. David says, and likewise we should say, It is you, Lord, that I need. It is you, Lord, that I want. Therefore, I will draw near to you. Now, you may have noticed that I skipped verses 3 and 4. And here, because of what David knows about God, and because of what David knows about himself and the goodness that is to be found in drawing near to God, that gives him a, a peculiar perspective on two other really big realities in his life. He experiences this goodness, and it helps him see other things particularly those who are around him who delight in God. He gains a perspective on them and his perspective on those who are around him who do not delight in God. In verse 3, he speaks about those who delight in the Lord. Notice what he says there. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. And likewise, we, as God's people, should delight in those who draw near to God with us. You see, there is a delight that we should take in one another. As we draw together to God as individuals, but as we also draw together as a church, I hope that you have experienced that delight and drawing near to God with other people because it is there. Paul echoes the same idea in Romans chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, where he's writing to the Christians in Rome whom he's never met, and he says, I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. You see, there is a delight that we can know as we seek and draw near to God together and find an echo with our voices together. We have no good apart from God. And then the second group is seen in verse 4. David describes those who don't draw near to God. He says in verse 4, The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The saints are a delight to David. Those who reject Jehovah and follow false gods, he says, I don't even name them. I, I don't want to have any part to do with those who follow other gods, other deities and tall types of idolatry that existed in David's day. And in our own, the same is true. People don't necessarily worship those types of gods primarily here in the Western world. There are gods of comfort and pleasure and power and stuff and reputation that people live for. That's the reason they exist. It's why they wake up on Monday morning to hit the road, not with an idea that I have no good apart from God, but there are other things out there that if I just get them, they'll bring me true joy and lasting pleasure. And it's all a lie. And David says, as God's people, we refuse to join with those people in seeking those things. We're not going to participate in pouring out their blood offerings. We don't take part in drawing near to their gods. Because we know there's no good there. Only a multiplication of sorrows is found in the neglect of drawing near to the only God who has good for his creatures. So David says, I'm not going to be drawn into that idolatry because I know there's no good there. And like David, we echo drawing near to God is our good. It clarifies our vision and it helps us to see that there is no good apart from the Lord. And David has said it loud and clear for us this morning. As for me, the nearness of God 
is my good. And Psalm 16 is a powerful statement to us. As a matter of fact, I think it's one of the most beautiful statements in all of the Bible of why a person should desire to draw near to God. There is goodness to be found in drawing near to God. And now in his kindness and in his wisdom, God takes Psalm 16 that David wrote and he collects that Psalm with other Psalms and puts it in one book, the Psalms. And then he takes the book Psalms and puts it with other books into what we have now as the Bible. And some now, 3,000 years after David penned this psalm, it is here for us as part of the living and abiding Word of God. And as we've read it, and as I've been preaching it the whole time, God has been whispering over us this song. And in this David song, he speaks of a reality that there is no good apart from God. Experiencing and showing us these proofs of God's goodness, that we have Him as our spiritual possession that He is daily providing spiritual provision for us, that He has assured us of a final spiritual safety. And in Him, we find a complete spiritual wholeness. And as a result, we should make this psalm our song. Preserve me, O God, for in You I take refuge. I say to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have no good apart from You. I have set the Lord always before me because He is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure because you make known to me the path of life. And in your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Saints, we have no good apart from God. Let us not waste our lives drawing near to other gods, which will multiply our sorrows. Let us unite together and draw near to the God who's at His right hand, our pleasures forevermore. Let's pray. Father, we thank You. What a joy it is to know the goodness that You have given to us, Lord. And Father, I pray that as we set these things before our minds, that they would help us to resist the temptation to believe there is goodness elsewhere. Father, we are daily, moment by moment, bombarded with lies that there is goodness to be found apart from God. Lord, help us to see that as a lie of our enemy. And Father, instead, to reflect on this goodness that you have given to us and giving us yourself and daily walking with us, of assuring us of final victory over the enemy, which is death. And to see that our wholeness is found in you because that's what you created us to experience life. Father, strengthen us and help us to, to trust these truths when we are faced with temptation of the lies. And Father, may we find and experience this true joy, this true completeness, this true happiness that David speaks of, and that we would run to you as our refuge, who is our source, our only source of goodness in this life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.